How's that? Can people hear me in the back pretty well? I'll use my big boy voice. <clears throat> Thank you. It's good to be with you all this morning. Um, as uh, Dr. Smith mentioned, I was based in Lexington, and I came to Princeton in 2015. We're going to talk a little bit about introduction to soils. For those of you who are here with NRCS and have a, an NRCS soils kind of mandate, frankly, this is going to be... Uh, a little bit of a, of a review, but it's intended to help people understand some of the resources that are available to you, and particularly Web Soil Survey. So what we're going to focus on here is knowing your soil, what can be learned from the soil survey, particularly the Web Soil Survey version, what are the larger considerations or limitations to soil productivity that you can learn in that document that will help you understand how to lay out, how to plan. Some of the more sophisticated planning tools can actually adjust paddock orientation, size, and everything based on soil limitations. For a given soil named in the survey, what are the inherent properties that make for a good soil and maybe some that are not so good? They have limitations that will change how you manage that area within the farm. And then towards the end, I'm going to introduce soil health. Soil health kind of implies that the doctor, which is in this case is you all, or the grower, can change something and make a soil healthier. And what soil properties might be changed? Inherent properties are inherently difficult to change. But there are other properties of the soil, some chemical, some physical, that you can adjust in a favorable manner to create a healthier soil. So I'm going to start out with the Web Soil Survey. This is, you get this by just putting Web Soil Survey into Google or your other favorite search engine. And basically, you're going to start by pressing the green button. That's really how this whole thing starts. It's a great tool. This is the initial page that pops up. You have this area of interest interactive map. Covers the lower 48 in this particular, particular pictorial. But if you were in Hawaii or Alaska, it would come up with something different, trust me. The first thing you want to want to put in is your address, but this one accepts lat long right off your phone. So if you do, if you're standing in the field, you've got a good service to your phone, and you've got a GPS location, you can put that in here as well. Once you get an address, you have to create what's called an area of interest up here. Okay? To do that, you have to highlight an area using those keys there. It can be a pure rectangle. I come from Michigan originally, which was laid out in what we call the range and township method, and almost everything is a square. But in Kentucky, you end up having to use a more irregular, which is the one furthest to our right. And I highlighted this area. This is an old picture of the research center prior to an F4 tornado taking it out. This was part of the debris field from the upper part, or this lower part down here, all this debris ended up somewhere in here, and this ended up across the road. But you can highlight an area. So this is an area that was a grassland area, still is. And you want then to develop a map from that. You're going to go to the next tab. It's called the Soil Map tab. And you're going to, from the AOI, you're going to learn that you've got 12 acres in this area. Now, that's an estimate. Don't get jazzed about the 0.1 acres. That's not probably that accurate. But it gives you a good idea of how much area you're looking at. So from the Soil Map tab, you get the same area of interest, and it generates a soils map for you. The little symbols in here, CRB2, CRC3, whatever, LD, will come up on this page defined. It'll give you what does that code mean? Crider B2 is a Crider silt loam. B slope, 2 to 6%, eroded. And it constitutes about 22% or 2.7 acres of this particular AOI. Another one is the Crider C3, steeper, 6 to 12% slope, severely eroded. Right now, you get to see as you pull this up on your phone or your computer for a farm or that you're 
own or a farm you're maybe you're thinking about renting, you get to have an understanding of an inherent limitation. Slope, greater slope equals greater erosion potential. It doesn't mean it will always be eroded, but it probably does. All right? When the mappers map, and I've mapped, they will distinguish an area that has not been eroded from one that has been. So if you get a 6 to 12% slope, and it doesn't say severely eroded, it may say merely eroded or uneroded, that's a gem compared to what is the usual expectation. And these do occur in the survey. The Lynn side has another limitation. That's this area, right in this area here, going up through here. It is occasionally flooded. That's a clue that that's an inherently wet soil. Okay. So this is our area now going forward, and those are the descriptors that go with it. If you click on this particular box here, you will get a description of a typical profile for that particular map unit. It may not be exactly what's at that point, though, in the field. It's a typical pedon, a typical profile. It starts out with what's the setting, what's the typical composition, crider and similar soils, a description of the landform. It sits on ridges, it's on the summits, except in this case it's probably on the side slope a bit. Typical depth of the A horizon, P means it was probably plowed in the past. BT1, the start of the, sub, the heavier clay subsoil, texture picks up, starts getting into clay here. And then it gives a number of properties. These are the ones that you pay most attention to when you're thinking about what are the inherent benefits or inherent limitations to that particular soil. 60 to 157 inches to lithic bedrock, in this case usually limestone. Deeper profiles, better rooting development potential. Drainage class, well drained partly because of slope, but partly also internal good drainage means you're less likely to have problems growing plants that are not happy with being waterlogged. Waterlogging will be transient on a soil like this. Capacity of the most limiting layer to transmit water, which is in the BT, very low to moderately high. There are places where that clay layer is tight, hard to get through. Depth to water table, though, is typically more than 80 inches. Again, not much problem with flooding, no flooding, no frequency of ponding. Available water in 60 inches of this soil is fairly high, 11.3 inches. But remember, just because it says 60 inches of soil doesn't mean you can access 60 inches of soil with the rooting that you're getting. Moving on to the next one, which is this one here, a lot of differences. Number one, this is a lot shallower to heavier clay. It's been eroded. You've lost the silty topsoil in this part of the state. Again, it's well drained and all that, but it doesn't hold as much water because you've lost part of the silt that is part of the plant available water holding capacity potential. And its capability classification is a 4E, meaning it's highly limited by erosion, past erosion. And it's mapped that way. The Lynn side presents a very different perspective. Landform, it's typically on flood plains. It's moderately well drained. It doesn't hold water real badly, but it is occasionally flooded. Frequency of flooding is occasional to none. It's classified a 2W. W stands for wetness. S stands for stoniness. This is done by the field mappers when these are mapped. So you have to understand these limitations are coded in. And the more severe the limitation, the bigger the number. One means almost no limitation. Two, a little bit. Three, some more. Four, bug ugly. It goes up to six, by the way. Maybe eight now. You can take this information. You can say, I want to explore that soil data. 
hit that tab, Soil Data Explorer. And then I went down here and I said, well, this is a non-irrigated crop area. I want to see the map and the table. And the crop I put in here was grass, legume, hay. There's a downloading box here you can get into. So you can not only explore the soils, you can explore what looks like to be a kind of yield potential. In this particular case, it has two of the areas, the Lin side and the Kreider B2 mapped in blue, and the Kreider C3 is mapped in red. So it grouped them for productivity purposes. Two of the units have been grouped together, and that's important also for management, laying out paddocks, grazing areas. So in this area, though, you have a number of other things you could select from. You can look at crop productivity index. You can look at forest. Some of these Kreider C3s are still in trees. You have some specific things for states like Iowa, Minnesota, and range production for western regions. Yields of irrigated crops, but these are rarely irrigated, so that's why I went to yields of non-irrigated crops. But there are other windows available to you if you have the kind of soil resource on your farm or in this area you're renting that you might want to consider another use of to optimize your benefit from that particular area. This is the table that's associated with the previous map. You'll notice that the rating is a 5-5 for both Kreider B2 and the Lin side, which is not that different, but it's significantly higher than the rating of 5 on the Kreider silt loam. And the description is yields of non-irrigated crop, in this case, tons of hay. So that gives you a clue of some of the information you can get off this document. It gives a description of what's behind that in this area below, which is very useful. You may discover there are some things that don't apply very well to you, makes that data less than useful to you. A lot of it's testimonial. Some of it's quantitative, but a lot of it's testimonial in this box. So let me review here a minute. Inherent limitations, things that are very difficult to change. Texture, is the soil sandy? Is it clay? Is it stony? Does it have significant slope? And is that slope eroded? Is it a wet-natured soil? Is it shallow to bedrock or an otherwise limiting layer? By their nature, inherent properties are difficult to change. And you can sometimes remove stones. I worked in the first 20 years of my life for a father who really believed in removing stones in southern Michigan glacial till country. Let me tell you. So I know a lot about moving stones. You can drain wet areas up to a certain point. Sometimes it's a real challenge. Again, in the part of the world that I come from, you irrigate the sands and you drain the swamps. And that's the only two kinds of dirt in my part of Michigan there really is. But otherwise, land management has to optimize the use of the resource in the face of those limitations. This is a very common West Kentucky limitation. Anybody know right off the bat what I'm looking at here? Not exactly. It's clay urea. I'm looking at this layer that kind of starts right in this region here. Rajapan. Another way of showing this thing is it loves to perch water. And if this thing starts 24 inches below the surface, it doesn't take long with early winter rains, and it's filling up. And then you got mud. And this is as difficult for cattle people as it is for row crop people because it really limits trafficability. And you have to figure out how you're going to manage around it because it's not a property that's easy to change. What happens is in the soil, some of the cracks and crevices get filled in with a form of naturally occurring cementing agent. 
Now, one of the reasons I'm bringing this up is because the green stuff is where these occur in this state. 2.7 million acres of Kentucky is affected to varying degrees. Not all Fragipans are equal, but they're affected by Fragipans. These are a real challenge for cattle folks because, frankly, a lot of row croppers avoid a lot of these acres. Sir? There are soils where, if you think of like the river bottoms, there are soils there where the water table comes up and the depth to water table becomes zero when they actually saturate and start to flood. They, some of them flood from the bottom up as the water basin fills up. So the depth to water table in those cases varies. In other cases, it's caused by a rock or otherwise impervious layer. Here, it'll be the depth to Fragipan will be the depth to an impermanent water table, temporary water table. That's what I mean by that. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions like that? That's a good question. But this is a very common limiting factor. And a lot of row crop folks like to stay away from it, and a lot of cattle folks end up dealing with it. It's a naturally occurring restrictive layer. It's formed, we say, in soils pedologically, formed in soil formation. It's the result of a new material that was layered over an older soil profile. The LUS events that occurred 10,000 years ago, roughly with the last couple glaciations, generate a lot of silt. And in certain places where that silt was deposited on the old material, it formed a fragile band. In others, it did not. And the pedologists have been fighting for years about why that happened and why not. Let's not even get into that. The average depth in the state of Kentucky is 20 to 24 inches. Some soils have greater thickness and therefore are more productive and therefore are typically row cropped. Soils like Grenada, Zanesville, typically a little more depth, a little bit more water holding capacity before that restrictive layer is encountered. The frangipan itself can be as little as a couple feet or less, up to four foot thick which means you don't get to tile it away. I've known people to tile into that, two foot into that, and then it seals right over the tile. Not, a quick, not quickly. It may take 10 years. But where I come from, tile is supposed to last 30 years. And if it only lasts 10, that makes a tiling job really pricey. It's too wet in late winter, early spring, and it's too dry in late summer, early fall in a typical Kentucky climate situation, and therefore limits available water in late summer, early fall, and you got too much and too much mud in late winter, early spring. Any questions before I move away and we start talking about soil health responses? Sir? You uh, various published uh, soil maps showing exactly soil type in a particular area? Mm -hmm. There are published ones. The Web Soil Survey is the web version of that. And the, but it depends. Some of these published ones are not very widely available anymore. They've started to disappear. You can check with your library or check with NRCS, your local NRCS district office for those. Okay? But there is that same thing that's on Web Soil Survey is available in a published format. Ma'am. The, the kind of improvements you're likely to make are going to fall in this kind of a category. The basic underlying soil wouldn't change often enough, but typically mapping, you know, in, in my area of Michigan, they've only remapped my county three times in 100 years. You know, it's not very often. There's two places in your county where you can get more information about the soils within that county. One is your NRCS district office. They have a certain kind of information and a certain approach to it. And then the other place you can go is your county extension office, and they would tap into 
things more on this side, on the management side, that come from UK and uh, maybe some other nearby universities that have similar soils and similar experiences. Yeah. So now we're going to talk about soil health responses, which I call management responsive soil properties. And soil health, contrary to the kind of popular opinion, soil health is about physical and chemical soil properties. Let me say at the outset that soil physical properties define the house that sustains soil life. And soil chemical properties define the utilities, the electricity, the propane that define, that sustain soil life. The microbes, the vertebrates, the invertebrates, the roots, the crops, that's all part of soil life. For me, soil biology is no different than corn. The response in soil biology is related to the quality of the environment they live in. So in the same way you measure corn yield and get an idea about how healthy, you measure grass legume yield, you get a measure of soil health. These are all just measures, results of that. These create this environment for the soil life. Soil biology is not soil health. It is a result of soil health. Starting with the physics part, the fundamental thing that we need to understand is the role of the aggregate. That little bit block of soil, little bit piece of soil, not a clod, that's not a good aggregate, but they exist. It may contain a root, it has layers of clay stuck in it and some other particles, and it's got a void space usually where all kinds of biological activity is humming along. I like this, came from Tom Schumacher at South Dakota State, and he said, all soils have porosity, but which really have structure? good structure. I've seen soils like this, and I've seen soils like this. What do you think provides a better structure for soil life? Where you have good sized, regularized aggregates, you get good porosity for air movement, roots require air, aerobic organisms require air. You have to have functional utility. Which of these is going to resist erosion? Which of these is going to resist compression, treading by cattle, tire traffic? Structure adds value that is not measured by chemistry. There's no salt test for structure. A lot of times you assess soil structure by taking a spade or another tool, digging up a lump of soil, breaking it apart, and seeing how the roots are growing and also looking at those aggregates as they break apart. Plant roots drive the structure in grassland soils. One of the ways you renovate a soil with poor structure is to introduce more root mass. And one of the ways of entering more root mass, frankly, is letting that crop grow a little taller before you clip it back, either through grazing or cutting, so that those roots have a better chance to ram through that soil and create structure and porosity. Typically, this is a no-till environment, but it could be a grassland soil. Typically, down here at larger pore diameters, we start to store more water. So the water content of the soil is greater in these environments where you've got better structure. What does that mean? Two to four days without wilt before the next rainfall event. May not be enough, but it's more than you have if you've got a beat up soil that doesn't hold as much water. Soil chemical health. You always start with a soil test. And I'm going to strongly recommend that if you want to tap into the resources that Dr. Teutsch had me talk about, the resources of NRCS, the resources of the Extension Service, you need to use the soil test that is most likely promoted. And they are not all public labs. Some of them are private labs by your Extension Service. Soil testing is not a perfect science. Every field is somewhat unique. 
but it is especially important when fertilizer prices are high and the salt test values turn out low, because there are some ways to hedge. You need to target the lime and the fertilizer applications you make to pastures or hayfields with greater potential for an economic or profitable response. This is just a guideline. We're going to go over some of this in the field. Dr. Ritchie and I are going to be with you in a soil sampling thing. But you take a composite sample from the area that's representative, 15 to 20, and you take them four inches deep. That's the recommendation in Kentucky. For Wisconsin, they may have correlated and calibrated their results on a zero to six inch sample. But it's important to know what depth is recommended. Getting that representative area and getting it to the representative depth are important. The first thing I argue in pasture and hayfield environments is this. Get the pH where it needs to be. Ag lime, at least around here, hasn't risen in price as much <laughs> as fertilizer had. Ag lime is still, except for the diesel fuel part, is relatively reasonable. You can have a lot of impact on nutrient availability, especially phosphorus, sometimes zinc, and it's really good to maintain forage legume numbers, growth, and nitrogen fixation, which means it helps make part of your nitrogen requirement. To be valuable, you need to understand what the salt test phosphorus or salt test potassium response looks like. It's the law of diminishing returns. It's not linear. You don't keep getting yield as you keep on raising the salt test. That doesn't happen. It levels off. Where you want to be, typically, is you're going to want to be somewhere about here. You don't want to be above high. There's nothing there for you and your lab can key in what the state requirements are and go with that. I can see I'm playing on a Mac with my... Bottom line is, you use the salt test to predict the right rate. It's not well defined, it's not perfectly defined, it's a prediction. If you have a high salt test level, you don't have a zero probable probability of a profitable response. You've got about 15% one. But I don't go to Vegas and play for 15%. The break-even point is somewhere in the middle of the medium range. Medium minus, it goes up above 50%. Low, it's higher, and very low, it's even higher. These estimates do vary with soil type and seasonal weather, but the bottom line is you don't get much chance of getting a return on the fertilizer dollar when you get above mid-medium. So I'm going to close with a couple take-home points. Really good grassland soils have a, appropriate inherent properties. It doesn't mean you can't work with other soils. You can't, and you can make money on them, but you have to understand these inherent limitations and manage around them. Texture, profile depth, minimal erosion, stones, and wetness. Good soils also need to have good soil health and their management response of chemical and physical properties have to be maintained in an area or in a region of values that optimize growth, biological activity, crop recovery. Sometimes just crop recovery after a grazing event is stimulated by having good soil health. That means the crop is in a better shape when you rotate back into it because you've done a good job of managing that soil. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? All right. You're welcome.